Welcome to Fayette Baptist Church on this wonderful September day. We'll take it, won't we? Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. A lot of us sing that jingle in our head, don't we? Hosanna means, Lord, please. Lord, please help me. Lord, please save me. Lord, please restore me. Lord, 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 please. That's what Hosanna means. It's a cry out from his people. And it's, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it says. Speaking of Jesus. But you could be the only Jesus someone knows. You could be blessed, you could be the blessed one that comes in the name of the Lord. When someone cries out, Hosanna, for their need. Let's pray, shall we? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we cry out to you. Whether it be in a need, maybe it's just in a praise. Hosanna in the highest. We think of our Lord Jesus. Blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, please, Lord, save us. Please save all mankind. That's what you did on the cross. Just mankind needs to accept that. May your spirit move in that regard till the ground for the seed to be planted. Lord, we cry out in praise and honor and glory to you through this service. And we also cry out, dear Lord, with our needs in our hearts. And may you send someone to meet that need. May it be here today. May it be this week. And then we know that the Lord hears our cries as his children. We love you, Lord. We thank you and bless this time. May you be glorified and may we be edified as your children. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Before we uh, worship the Lord with song, I would like for all of you to stand and let's read this psalm together. This is Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands.
from death to life for you Search the world.
sing Hos Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here. Yes, Lord, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. There is nothing better than you. Uh, just thinking about the words of that song, Lord, you turn graves into gardens. And I know sometimes in life it feels like each of us goes through a grave period, Father, whether it's the loss of loved ones or trials. Um, but we know that you can turn each of those into gardens and to bring fruit for your glory. And you turn... bones into armies. Thank you, Father. Uh, that picture is so beautiful in Ezekiel, of uh, just bringing dead things back to life. And we praise you this morning that you are the author of life. Um, just what a gift it is to worship and sing. And just imagine you in your throne, Father, in your glory. Um, we thank you that we're a part of the church throughout the ages, all over the world right now, praising you in every tongue and language and every culture throughout time in history, Father, and then one day the whole church will be gathered before you, and we'll cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, we long for that day, Father. As we contend on this earth, um, this fallen world, and, and the trials and tribulations that it brings, we just focus our eyes on you and just remind one another that, that we have hope and that we have joy and that you are the source of, of that for each of us. So we praise you today and we remember you and we lift you high. We remember each in the body, Father, who has a need for healing or for provision. Uh, you are the healer, you are the provider. Um, we ask that you would be working among us to meet the needs that are here. And we remember um, Pastor Henry and Pastor Chris this week as they go to Mexico. What an awesome opportunity it is to partner with believers in another culture. And I pray that you would go before them in this trip for traveling mercies and protection, for wisdom and for skill with the language and cultural barriers. Um, that all of that would fall away, Father, that we are one in you and that you would be guiding them and giving them wisdom to know the next steps that we can take to support the ministry there protect their families as they're gone. Um, just thank you that we get to partner with you in so many different parts of the world. Um, sometimes our lives can be kind of consuming here, and I just pray that we would remember to lift up our missionaries and those who are persecuted and, and far away, Father, that they're near to your heart, and they need to be as well in ours. Um, and I thank you, and I praise you this week for Pastor Jeff starting, and what a gift he is to our church growing up here and his beautiful family, and I pray blessings on his ministry, um, just for wisdom and insight. As he leads the youth and ministers to the families, um, you would uh, just mesh him in so well with the pastors and the elders and, and just bring some beautiful things out of that ministry. And we thank you for the service today, and I pray for Pastor Russ that you would give him the words that you want us to hear, that we would be responsive. Um, I also lift up those who are being baptized today and they're taking that step of obedience and we praise you that we can celebrate together with them and if there's some here who that you're prompting to take that step that they would be bold um, to do that today that we can um, just celebrate alongside of them and help them to grow in their faith and maturity. So thank you God for the gift of today that we everybody here woke up and we have breath in our lungs and that we can use that to praise you. We put everything in your hands, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Good morning. Um, this week I want to encourage you to remember to pray for Pastor Henry and Chris, as Pastor Chris, as they go down to Mexico and partner um, with Franco and Barbie, missionary family down there. Um, just be lifting them up for safe travels and protection and, and for um, just God to open the doors of ministry that he has for them down there. 
Today is our annual church picnic and baptism, so I would encourage you all to come join us today. If you didn't pack a lunch, you can always stop and get something on the way um, or swing by your house like I have to. Uh, fully, we'll see you there. And if, if you can only come to the baptism, that will be at 2 p.m. It's at Camp Berea and Turner, 113 Bear Pond Road in North Turner. So hopefully we'll see you all there. Um, I want to invite the ladies here to attend our fall retreat next Friday and Saturday, September 17th and 18th. It's at Camp Good News. We're going to be working through a Beth Moore study, um, Chasing Vines, on the transforming quest of vine chasing, where she will show us how nothing in our lives is wasted. Amen to that. Come and meet Christ in the vineyard, tracing the images of the vine dresser, vine, branch, and fruit through scripture. See how everything changes when you let your maker show you why you matter. Find out how to live an immensely fruitful life. That sounds really good. Um, sign up after the service at the information desk out in the cafe. Also next weekend, Ignite is kicking off, so I want to invite any student who's in sixth grade through 12th to come join us for our youth group. We meet every Sunday here at the church from 4 to 6 p.m. I especially want to invite anyone who has never come before. Um, there's a place for you. We would love to have you come. It's a really great group of teens and leaders, and Jeff has some great stuff planned for you this year. So hopefully we'll see you next week at 4. Uh, let's see. Okay, last one. Today is our Sunday school kickoff. So if you are a student or a child, ages four to six, your Sunday school will be taking place in the modular building over here, and there's a sign-in for you. And if you are ages seven to 10, you'll still be out in the red building. So that's all I have for you. During the next song, students are invited to go to Sunday school. Thanks.
are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Amen. You may be seated. Some years ago, um, Mercedes Benz had a TV commercial. You probably remember it of uh, showing their car crashing into a concrete wall during a, very, a safety test. And an engineer in a white lab coat would walk over after the crash and kneel down to examine the damage to the vehicle, which was fairly minimal. And a reporter then asked the engineer about Mercedes' energy absorbing car body. And after the engineer tells about the unique design, uh, the reporter asked him why Mercedes doesn't enforce the patent on their design. A design evidently copied by several other companies because of its success. The engineer then replied very matter-of-factly. He says, because some things in life are too important not to share. Remember that commercial? Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7 says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace, of salvation, the news that God, the God of Israel reigns. Indeed, some things are too important not to share. The last time we were together, we began to look at some crucial considerations for being involved in, in the sharing of the gospel ministry that Christ has called his disciples to, namely us. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, uh, if you have them, or on your devices, whichever you prefer. But Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15 is what we're working through. And last week I suggested to you that the central idea of Christ's message in Matthew 10, 5 through 15, is that Christ's ministry is the Christian's mandate. And as followers of Christ, we're called to be involved in that ministry, the ministry of the gospel. And we can only do that faithfully and effectively when we understand the principles that he gave in order to, ca to carry that ministry out. And Jesus outlined those general principles, and they are available to us in that chapter, even though this mission to the original 12 was slightly different than the final one given to all Christians just before Jesus' ascension in Matthew 28 and in Acts chapter 1. Within this context of Jesus' instructions, we can find seven timeless principles that are transferable to the life and ministry of every Christian sitting in this room. And so last week I gave you the first three of those seven. We're going to look at the last four today. Here's the recap before we can effectively minister for Christ, we must first realize that we have a clear commission. Clear commission, verse 5 of chapter 10 of Matthew. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter into any city of the Samaritans. Matthew records that after giving them instructions, Jesus sent them out. They didn't volunteer for the ministry. He commissioned them them for ministry. And the same is true for us today. From the day of your salvation, if you are a believer in Christ, he knew what ministry he had picked out for you to accomplish. Do you know what that is? That was the question that I kind of left you with last, night, last week. I left you with an important question to reflect upon, and it was this. What am I dedicating my life to as a Christ follower that is contributing to the building up of his kingdom. That was your homework assignment to meditate on last week. Because Jesus not only calls us to be his disciples, but he also commissions us to be his sent ones as well. We have a responsibility to respond. And ministry becomes effective only when we realize, first, that we have a clear commission. Secondly, we have a concise objective. Again, verses 5 and 6, I'll just read verse 6. But rather, 
Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he said, Jesus sent them out, and he said, don't go to the, by the way of the Gentiles, not the way of the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Every church, every ministry, every believer, mind you, has a specific objective and a purpose to fulfill, which adds to the overall purpose of Christ. Jesus sent these 12 out on a very specific and pointed mission. Not only did he tell them what their target was, but he told them what to avoid as well. And I suggested to you last week that that's important for us to understand. We need to know what not to do as well as what we should be aiming at. Amen? And at this particular time, the Lord's mission for them was very narrow and limited. It was designed to prepare the way for him as he went. And the Lord works with us in the same manner. Sometimes he starts us out on a ministry very pointed in one area and then expands it as we gain understanding and maturity and develop our gifts into a greater ministry that includes more and more parameters. An effective ministry demands that we have a clear and concise objective keeping in step with the Lord's will, okay? Question is, do you have one? Christ calls us to be effective within the body, and that requires, first, a clear commission, second, a concise objective, and thirdly, to communi we communicate with a central message. Okay, that was the last thing that we covered last time. Verse 7, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If there's one thing the world does not need, it's confusion about what a ministry or a person is trying to communicate. Would you agree with that? Jesus gave the disciples a simple, clear message to preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Later, that message would take on a whole new form of the good news that forgiveness of sins and eternal salvation is now available by the grace of God through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and that he's coming again. You believe he's coming again? Say amen. He is. And the central message of the kingdom revolves around that king coming again and being present with us now in our hearts. Whatever ministry you find yourself called to, regardless of how big or how small, it will be characterized by the fact that Jesus is king. Say that with me. Jesus is king. It's his kingdom that we are involved in. The central message of the kingdom is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if that message is not clear, then the ministry will be absolutely ineffective for carrying out the objectives to which we've been commissioned. Now, there's a fourth consideration. So we'll be jumping into the new stuff now, okay? That is crucial for any ministry to be effective, and that is the fact that the people Christ commissions to carry this message must have a confirmed credibility. A confirmed credibility. Look at verse 8. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Now, most professional occupations require confirming credentials, right? When's the last time you entrusted your health to a doctor with no credentials? Maybe you shouldn't answer that question. If the world demands credentials in order to practice medicine, how much more should God's representatives have something that confirms their authenticity and credibility? Is that right? I'm not talking about a Bible degree. Jesus gave his apostles the power to perform certain signs that would give them credibility in the eyes of those to whom they ministered. These characteristics encompass two primary areas, okay? If you look at this verse, you can break them down into two primary areas. Number one was their activity and number two, in the ministry, their attitude toward ministry. And the same two areas apply to us. Let's look at the first thing. Our credibility as disciples of Christ is confirmed through our Christ-like activity. Heal the sick, raise the dead, verse 8, cleanse the lepers, 
cast out demons. Literally, what Jesus says in this verse, the literal language reads like this. The ailing ones heal. And that Greek word is the word we get therapy from. The dead ones awaken. The lepers cleanse. The demons expel. That's literally what he said. Now, these were the signs which authenticated the true apostles, the sent ones, in the early church. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12 says this, the things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, and miracles were done among you with great perseverance. So in the early church, the apostles were known by these signs that they would perform. They were the same signs that Jesus performed, identifying him as the promised Messiah. You can look that up in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 to, five, three to 6, talk about what kinds of signs you would be able to identify the Messiah would be. These signs and wonders were the only tangible proof that the world had that these men were truly representatives of Jesus Christ. Okay? At that time, follow me now very carefully. It's very important you understand this. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it, by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. That's what Hebrews says. Now, at that time in the New Testament, the New, New Testament times, the New Testament wasn't actually in existence, okay? It was not available to confirm the message of the apostles, it's for that reason that I believe these miraculous signs, now be careful how you hear what I'm saying, that these signs are no longer the normative way to identify a true disciple today. Okay? Hear me closely. In fact, the enemy has seen fit to provide plenty of convincing counterfeits intended to delude and deceive the unsuspecting. Now, please hear me again clearly. Yes, I absolutely believe that God may still perform these things. I am not a cessationist. Using people in very unique circumstances for very specific purposes. But they are not the common stuff of everyday Christian life, okay? They are not the common stuff of everyday Christian life as we know it. Having said that, however, on a spiritual level, similar credentials will accompany a believer who is effectively ministering the true message of the gospel. For instance, let me give you an example. We may not physically heal the ones who are weak, but when we minister in Christ's compassion, when we are instrumental in bringing someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he strengthens and heals their broken spiritual condition and makes them whole. Amen? Christ fills our human weakness with his divine power. We may not physically raise the dead, but we can awaken people to a spiritually revived life through the proclamation and the spirit and dwelt gospel. Amen? We may not physically cleanse lepers, but through the teaching of the word, we can lead people to holy living. We can bring cleansing truth of Christ to a sin-polluted world. Amen? And we may not visibly expel demons. But through diligent prayer and the accurate communication of truth, Satan is thwarted and rendered powerless. Amen? These actions are clear evidence that we are Christ's representatives because they characterize Christ's ministry. You will see that in Luke chapter 4. You might want to turn there. 
Luke chapter 4, this is what Jesus said his ministry was as the Messiah. Verse 16, it says, He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Isn't that the same thing that Jesus sends us out to do? These are clear evidences that we are representatives of Christ. The authenticating marks of a true disciple will be seen in our actions as we, under the power of the Holy Spirit, exhibit the character of Christ through the fruit of the Spirit. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, and gentleness. All those things we exhibit are fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Okay? A number of years ago, you may remember this too. There was this wave of, of things that was going on in the churches. And they were calling it a new revival. Things like uncontrollable laughter. For hours, they would sit in the pews and laugh, 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 till their sides were spitting, splitting, trembling, roaring like a lion, barking like a dog, growling, spitting in the Holy Spirit. I'm glad you guys aren't doing that right now. <laughs> and incredible as it sounds, vomiting in the Holy Spirit. It swept through many churches and were supposed to be the authenticating signs of Christ's disciples who were filled with his Spirit. Okay? In my opinion... These are the credentials of a church that's totally blind and spiritually unconscious. Look it up in Isaiah 29, verses 9 and 10. Okay? Sounds a lot more like the New Testament description of demon possession than it does spirit possession to me. Now, I want to say that that's kind of a wave gone by. It still happens in some places. However, it's no different today, my friends. And I want you to be aware and beware of ministries that are wooing people in by their charismatic and attractive presentations, chart-topping music, and grandiose claims, but behind the scenes are practicing doctrinal heresy, deception, manipulation, and occult-like behavior, because that's happening now. That's happening now. Compassionate acts of love, aggressive concern for the lost, commitment to the truth, continual prayer, and Christ-like joy. These will all be some of the confirming credentials of an effective minister of Christ. Is that what people are seeing in you and me? I hope so. Are people confirming the fact that you're a follower of Christ by your activity? What is that activity? Is it credible? The next thing is our credibility as disciples of Christ is also confirmed through our Christ-like attitude. Look what it says here in verse 7 again at the end. Um, I'm sorry, verse 8. Freely you received, freely give. The message of the truth, the miracles, the ability to triumph over evil powers were all given freely to them by God. And they were not to use those things for their own personal gain. That's a major thing that you can look for. If all of these kinds of things are used, being used for personal gain in a ministry, well, I'm not so sure you could say that's probably Christ's intent, right? Our ability and power for ministry is to be primarily focused for God's glory, not in personal prosperity. Jesus' words are incredibly simple, yet they're undeniably clear. As the NEB, the New English Bible, translates it, you have received without cost, give without charge. Now tell me, how does that compare 
with some of the more flamboyant ministries that you know of today. In Jesus' day, the Jewish rabbis understood this concept. According to one historical resource, a rabbi was absolutely forbidden to take money for teaching the law, which Moses had freely received from God. In only one case could he accept payment for teaching a child. For teaching a child was a parent's task and no one else should be expected to spend time and labor for what the parents were responsible to do. But in the Jewish law, it was laid down as God taught Moses gratis, so do thou. Now rabbis, however, were to be taken care of by the people whom they served, but to actually charge for their teaching was unlawful, okay? According to the Didache, an early writing known as the teaching of the 12 apostles, it was written that one sure way to identify a false prophet was if he asked for money. That's interesting. The danger of profiteering was and still is a danger in the, in the church, isn't it? Now, the apostles could have amassed exorbitant amounts of wealth from their ministry at that time. Couldn't they have? Exorcists and magicians and physicians, they were in high demand and reimbursed very well. Actually, Acts chapter 8 gives us an example of that. There is nothing wrong. Now, let me say this, another disclaimer here. There is nothing wrong with being paid well as a minister of Christ or a ministry when it is offered. Paul told Timothy that elders who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, for the laborer is worthy of his labors, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5. But there is a serious danger when a speaker or a teacher or an evangelist demands an astronomical amount of money, as some do, just to show up at an event. That's a whole different story, isn't it? And the same is true of any pastor. As someone once said, the pastor who puts a price on his ministry prices himself out of God's blessing. The bottom line of ministry should never be how much does it pay? But is it God's will? Okay? Peter wrote to the Christian leaders of his day, shepherd the flock of God, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain. There can be only two basic loves, wrote Augustine, the love of God unto the forgetfulness of self or the love of self unto the forgetfulness and denial of God. That's Augustine. I'm told that when a Christian leader falls, you know, it's invariably with, in, in one of four areas. Sex, sloth, silver, or self. What are those four areas? The last two dangers are what Jesus warned against as he said, freely you receive, freely give. See, the Bible is loaded with warnings against the dangers of selfishness and the love of money. It's an old story, legend, legendary. One day, a certain old rich man of a miserable disposition revisited a rabbi who took the rich man by the hand and led him to a window. Look out there, he said, and the rich man looked out into the street. What do you see? asked the rabbi. Well, I see men and women and children, answered the rich man. Again, the rabbi took him by the hand and led him to a mirror. Now what do you see? Now I see myself, the rich man said. And the rabbi said, behold, the window there that you just looked out of is glass. And in the mirror, there is glass. But the glass of the mirror is covered with a little silver. And no sooner is the silver added than you cease to see others, but you only see yourself. Interesting little story. See, Jesus balanced his warning here, balanced our commission by also saying that those involved in ministry, in Christ's work, shouldn't have to worry about their needs being met, however. Because, he said, the worker is worthy 
of his support. And we're going to get that in a minute. Same text. So that's the fifth, and that's the fifth principle Jesus outlines for an effective ministry is that we should maintain a confident trust. A confident trust, verses 9 and 10. Look at those verses. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his support. Someone has said that materialism has nothing to do with amount, has everything to do with attitude. And our attitude in ministry should be one of confident trust and faith in God. Amen? Because God's going to supply. He always does. If he puts one, one of the scriptural promises that got my wife and I through Bible college in some very, very difficult times in our early years of ministry here was Philippians 4.19, which says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, he was talking about, he was writing that to the Philippian church. But there are other scriptures in which we can apply where God promises that wh whoever he puts into his work, he will provide for. Okay, Jesus sent the disciples out with instructions that they were to rely on him for everything. If you notice the verses here, everything. And again, it was to prepare them and to show them that whatever they came up against, God would provide for their needs. Now, later on, again, as the ministry expanded, Jesus' instructions would change. Okay, let's look at Luke 22 for a moment. Luke chapter 22, in verse 36, Jesus said to them in this particular context, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Almost seems like the exact opposite of what he's saying here. You see, later on, after Christ ascended into heaven, they were going to need to plan ahead for their mission, anticipating some of the downfalls. They would need to do what they responsibly could do and rely on God for the rest. But in this initial mission here in, in chapter 10, he wanted them to learn total dependence on him. And when God puts us into ministry, that's the first order of business we need to, to learn is dependence on him for our needs. Basically, what Jesus was telling them was that they were to go unencumbered, relying on the hospitality of God's people and the providence of God himself. And today he might have said it like this. He might have said to us, hey, go. I'm giving you a mission. Go, don't grab your coat, don't grab your wallet, don't grab your checkbook, don't even get the car keys, forget your cell phone. Right? Go as you are with whatever you have with you. The message is that urgent. That's what he was telling them here. He wasn't making the journey unnecessarily hard on them. He was teaching them that they should be ready and willing to go wherever they wanted. he wanted them to go to do whatever he wanted them to do at the instant he wanted them to do it. They shouldn't be hindered by worry and elaborate preparations. They should just be prepared to go. Now, how many people do you know that are that ready to go? I've only met a few people who were that ready at a moment's notice to pack up and leave for wherever God wanted them to go. Are you that ready? Am I? Have you and I put our roots so firmly into where we are right now that we would even refuse God's call on our life? Listen, friends, I'm no different than you are. Just because I'm up here spouting these words off, doesn't mean that I'm in any, any better position than you are in having to deal with the difficulty of them, right? I don't cherish the thought of God calling me and my wife to leave what we're familiar with and where we are relatively comfortable to go somewhere and start all over again. That's not a comfortable thought. 
But because he has, my attitude should be, yes, Lord, whatever. And that should be yours, right? I also realize that God is not so much trying to strip you or me of comfort, but his deepest desire is to strip us of care. And that's a lesson we always need to relearn. Always. Because we start to depend on him and then, then things start to go well and things are going good and then we start not depending on him so much anymore and we're depending on ourselves, right? And God says, okay, I'm going to teach you how to depend on me again. What does that kind of thing look like in practical life? Well, if we're living our lives ready to say yes whenever God calls, we're not going to be amassing all kinds of useless debt on this earth that would hold us back. We're not going to be so tied to a house and have so much junk and so many toys in our garage that we can't move to another location. Trust me, I'm learning that one really quickly. I like the comment someone once made, and I, and I, don't, I don't ask that you would even begin to pray this prayer, but someone once, made this, someone once made this comment, don't own so much clutter that you will be relieved to see your house catch fire. You should declutter before that takes place. We're not going to be unnecessarily anxious about clothes or food or money or our life because we will have a confident trust that God will supply. We'll do just what it says in Matthew chapter 6. We will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us, right? That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Friends, if there's one thing I've learned in my years of being a follower of Christ, if there's one truth that you can take away from this, it's this. Jesus doesn't call us to serve him and then abandon us in the process. He doesn't. Verse 10, second part of the verse, says, for the worker is worthy of his support. The double-sided truth to all of this is simply this. The disciple of Christ who is involved in the work of his kingdom should never be over-concerned with material things, but the people of God should never fail in their duty to see that the minister of God receives adequate support. That's the double-sided thing here. So bottom line is Jesus wants his disciples in a state of preparedness, of confident trust. Clear commission, concise object, objective, central message, a confirmed credibility, a confident trust. Those are five essentials for an effective ministry. Two more, which are going to round out the picture, and we'll go through these quickly. Disciples engaged in ministering for Christ need number six, a careful discernment. Careful discernment. Look at verse 11. And whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his house until you leave that city. Okay, Jesus is really teaching us two things here. First, discernment must be exercised as to the moral and spiritual character of those whom a minister is closely associated with. Any minister, not just me, that's you if you're a Christian. Okay, Jesus is instructing his disciples that when they enter a town, they're to find out who is godly and willing to offer them hospitality and while they ministered, and to stay with them, to stay with someone that had a questionable reputation and a lifestyle in the community that was questionable would give the appearance of close fellowship and tolerance of sin and would cast incredible doubt on the message that they were preaching. Guilty by association, basically, is the modern phrase. Don't be deceived, Paul said. Bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Careful discernment, Jesus said, must be practiced by the representatives of Christ as they minister in the kingdom. Otherwise, the association may not only damage the effectiveness of the message, but also the spiritual integrity of the messenger. Again, don't misread or misinterpret what Jesus is saying or what I'm trying to explain. That is not to say that Christians should not open their arms or their hearts to people far from God. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't misquote me at all. That's precisely our commission, isn't it? It is. 
Jesus constantly ministered to who? Did he hang around with the Pharisees? No, he ministered to prostitutes and tax collectors and those who were considered to be sinners in his day. What's he saying here? What did Jesus not do? Jesus didn't make his headquarters in their homes. Okay? He welcomed everybody and he ministered to everybody, but he did not make his headquarters there in their home, being in partnership with them until they became followers of him. The Bible is clear that those partnerships, those close partnerships and intimate fellowships that we have with unbelievers that entangles our lives is not only forbidden, but actually impossible on a spiritual level. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14, says, Don't be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What's the implied answer here? Nothing. You have nothing spiritually in common with them. Jesus was teaching first that discernment must be exercised as to the moral and spiritual character of those with whom we are closely bound in partnership. Secondly, when they did find a worthy place to stay, they were to stay there until they moved on to another town. In other words, contentment and humility, humble satisfaction, is the heart of Jesus' point here. As they ministered, more luxurious and entertaining and comfortable accommodations might be offered by new supporters and converts. But Jesus says they're not supposed to bounce from house to house. Okay? I'm not making that up. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 7, Jesus said, stay in that house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house in that same location. Okay? But be content with what you have. They were to be and we are to be like the Apostle Paul who said, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need, but I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The disciple of Christ must exercise then careful discernment in his intimate associations and exhibit that his true motives are not materialistic, but spiritual. Finally, the seventh thing here is we need to strive to maintain a concentrated focus. That's in verses 12 to 15, and we'll round it out. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now Jesus is getting serious. Well, he's always been serious. But. Concentrated focus, Jesus says. Very simply, Jesus is saying, focus on the seekers, forego the scoffers. I know that sounds uncaring to some of you. It may not even sound Christian. Nevertheless, it is Christ's principle for an effective ministry. Okay? Focus on the seekers, he says, in verses 12 through 13. To focus on those who seek truth doesn't mean that we never take the ministry of Christ to areas that are resistant to it. Again, you have to be very careful in what you're hearing now. But it does mean that we are to concentrate our efforts on those who are hungering for truth. Okay? Ministry should be given first to those who not only need it, but who also want it. Seekers. 
seekers of truth, God will lead you to those people. And only you, through the, the discernment of the Holy Spirit, will be able to process that. I've seen, I've known people that have ministered to drug addicts for, for years who consistently reject the gospel truth. And then one day, the switch is flipped and they come to Christ. How did that person know whether they should shake the dust off their feet or keep ministering? Well, I can't give you a patent answer for that. Only the fact that the Holy Spirit needs to guide you in this. Okay? But there's going to come a time, Jesus says, where there needs to be a shaking of the dust and leaving the person to God because God's the one that does it anyway. You and I don't, right? Too often, pastors, leaders, counselors, and all kinds of Christian ministers spend so much time on people that have no intention of ever responding to God's truth that they have nothing left to give the ones that do. It should be the other way around. We're not to be driven by the tyranny of the urgent, but to be concentrated in our focus so that our efforts are effective. Look at verse 14. It says, whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words. I mean, if you're constantly ministering to somebody and they just consistently not take what you're saying and apply it to their life, well, you have to go by the Holy Spirit on that one. I can't tell you how many hours, you know, I spent in the first few years of ministry, away from my family, away from prayer, away from the study of God's word, dealing with unrepentant people who refused to listen to God's word and wanted to continue with their own agenda. And I didn't know enough to know which was which, who was really seeking and who was not. And it just about killed me, just about killed my family. And I did that because I truly wanted to help people. I did it because I thought that that was what a pastor was supposed to do. And I learned the hard way that continuing in that path would only not only destroy effectiveness in the ministry, but it could destroy families and marriage and ultimately me in the process. I see people shaking their heads yes out there. You, you know what we're talking about, what I'm talking about. And don't think I have this licked. It's a constant threat and a common one to anyone who's involved in ministry for Christ, whether you're just one-on-one -on -one with somebody doing discipleship or standing in a pulpit or leading a megachurch. It doesn't matter. That's not the way Jesus did ministry. It's not. Study Jesus' ministry. Reggie McNeil wrote this. He said, he said, persecution of church leaders in the North American context does not come from outside the church normally. It comes from inside the church. He said, I have never had a church leader say to me, I'm quitting. The pagans are getting to me. <laughs> I've had dozens of them say, I can't take the club members anymore. Study the way Jesus ministered and you will find that he concentrated the majority of his time and effort on those who were truly seeking the truth. The pattern of Jesus' life, according to Dick Mason, was this. Mark this down. Put it in your mental memory bank. To have a great deal of time for a few, some time available for the many, and enough time left to respond to the specific needs of others across his path. That pattern should be our pattern. But sometimes we get it all reversed. So, Jesus said, focus on the seekers. And then he says, forego the scoffers. Does that mean that we give up on people? Absolutely not. Jesus is illustrating a paramount truth here. Time is short, so make the most of it for the kingdom. We don't abandon people at the first rejection or even the second or third or even more, but when a person's heart is crystallized against God, we need to focus our efforts on others. And again, only, only the Holy Spirit will tell you when that point is. 
Jesus said clearly, do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Matthew 7, 6, those are Jesus' words. Instead, we're to shake the dust off our feet. It says here, we don't judge, we don't condemn, we just move on and we take it from there where the Spirit leads and it won't be pretty. It will not be pretty because God will take over at that point and it won't be pretty for them if they continue in their scoffing attitude. Look at what it says in verse 15. Jesus was very clear. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That's scary. And I've read that there are no trace of these two cities that have ever been found. They were judged for their rejection of truth, but according to Jesus, it'll be even worse for those who reject the messengers of Christ. These are the crucial considerations for effective Christian ministry at the beginning of Matthew chapter 10 here. The principles of Christ to his followers. We need to have a clear commission, a concise objective. We must communicate a central message and have a confirmed credibility. We need to maintain a confident trust in God a careful discernment of his will and a concentrated focus to carry out that will. Warren and David Wearsby wrote a book called Making Sense of the Ministry. And in that book, this is what they said. We are serving a wonderful master and he has called us to a wonderful life of service for his glory. Start now to integrate these principles into your life. Be prepared for some battles, but be assured that God can see you through them. The words of David Livingstone written at the close of his life remind us of the wonder of ministering for Christ. And here it is. He is the greatest master I have ever known. If there is anyone greater, I do not know him. Jesus Christ is the only master supremely worth serving. He's the only ideal that never loses its inspiration. He is the only friend whose friendship meets every demand. He is the only savior who can save to the uttermost. And we go forth in his name, in his power, and in his spirit to serve him. Unquote. And you know why? Because some things are too important not to share. Let's pray. Father in heaven, some of these words are pretty hard. Hard to take. Hard to understand. Hard to really decipher. I pray your Holy Spirit would just help us, Lord God, to to dig into these things a little more in our time after this. To really try to discern what you're trying to tell us individually, personally. Personally. But I know this one thing, those words of David Livingstone, they, they, they are paramount. We serve you because there is no one greater to serve. And because you are God and we worship you. We pray, our Father, that through Jesus Christ, we would walk keeping in step with the Spirit. For his name's sake.
today. Lord, help us as we just sang. We sang, our lives are yours. Help us to use them to bring others closer to you. Help us to trust in you and not in the world and all the things around us so that our roots won't be too deep. And help us to make an impact as we leave this place. We pray this in your name, amen. Glory, glory, hallelujah, Jesus, you are good. Glory, glory, hallelujah, Jesus, you are good. 
Have a great week, everybody.